Today, I want to, by the power of the Holy Ghost, share with us on a simple topic concerning the kingdom of God. And, and, and before I go into the juice of what we have to talk about, I come to realize that in a kingdom, for there to be a kingdom, there is certain things that is required. Number one, there must be a king. You can't have a kingdom without a king. And uh, woman, please do be offended. I know in England, the queen is Queen Elizabeth, and she has a kingdom. But it's simply to say there must be a sovereign ruler in any kingdom. Second thing, in any kingdom, there must be is people. If you're a king and you're ruling over animals, then you are not a king. You are a Tarzan. <laughs> you're not a king. They say Tarzan's the king of the jungle. He ain't really no king, believe me. And another thing I found out in, 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 in any kingdom, there must be some form of structure. And when I say structure, I mean physical structure. If you're a king, you need people to rule over. And then you must have a place, you must put your people for you to rule over them. You cannot be living in the desert, don't have no tent, don't have no house. And you have people out there in the desert, and you're saying that you're their king. You need some form of place to live or to house people in order for you to be a king. So three things, well, there's more than three, but the, you, you need a king, you need a people for the king to rule over, and you need physical structure in order for there to be have any form of kingdom. Another thing we're going to see is that... It, there need to be some type of law um, or to govern the kingdom. And in most cases, the, the law is not for so much for the king, but it's for the people. You all are with me? I'm, I'm taking my time, am I? We see a perfect example in Esther chapter, chap, around chapter 8, around there, with Esther. Esther was the queen... And she wanted to go before the king. The king was her husband. But Esther could not enter into the throne room of the king at will. She actually took a chance going before the king without being invited. And Esther understood that though she was queen, wife of the king... The kingdom did not belong to her. The kingdom belonged to the king. So one of the things we must understand in the kingdom, the people that are in the kingdom is not the ones that rule the kingdom. You may live in the kingdom, you may have authority and privilege in the kingdom, but the kingdom is not yours. The kingdom don't belong to you, the kingdom belongs to the king. So therefore, the rules and regulations for the kingdom is made by the king. And Esther understood that. So she, in order for her to go before the king, she told people, go and pray and fast. Because this is not an easy one. This could cost me my life. But I'm willing to lay my life down if you all will pray and fast with me. Let's make a sacrifice to God. Call upon the Most High to see what he will do on our behalf. So one of the first things we must understand in the kingdom is that the kingdom don't belong to us. We are in the kingdom and we have privilege and authority in the kingdom, but the kingdom is not ours. Because if the kingdom was ours, then we can do whatever we want because it belongs to me. Don't we say that as adults and some of us that are young and want to be adults? This is mine. I can do what I want with it. Don't we say that? Y'all, I'm trying not to preach now. Y'all help me now. Don't let me start to preach and yell. And I don't want to do that right now. That will come. But am I right? Don't we say that this is mine. I can do what I want with it. You can't tell me what to do with it because it is. Sometimes as Christians, we believe the kingdom is ours. And we can do what we want in the kingdom and with the kingdom. 
But we must understand that the kingdom is not ours. We are in the kingdom. We are a part of the kingdom. But it don't belong to us. It belongs to God. Hence the reason why the Bible said the kingdom of God suffer. Not the kingdom of the church. It belongs to God. So first thing we must understand in the kingdom is not ours. We are a part of it. We have a certain authority and privilege in the kingdom. But the kingdom is not ours. So therefore, we cannot set rules and regulation for something that belongs to somebody else. You all are too quiet on me. But that's good. That means you all are listening. But some of us as Christians believe that, hey, I'm a child of the king. I'm a part of the kingdom. And because of that, I have certain authority and certain privilege. And I am the child of the king. And as the child of the king, I can walk and do and please as I will. No, there are rules and regulations in the kingdom. Second, um, let's go to the Bible. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The rules of the kingdom. All right. It says, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm in first. For all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All law, all rules, all regulation for this kingdom is given by the inspiration of God, not by the inspiration of the people of the kingdom. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 6, 17. That the man of God, that the people in the kingdom might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The kingdom is not yours. It's not mine. The kingdom is the Lord's. And the Lord, master king of his kingdom, have given us instructions. He has given us laws and regulations whereby we may please the king. And that is the Bible. All scripture is given by him for our profit, for our benefit, that we might be thoroughly furnished. When you think of thoroughly furnished, what do you think about? You have an office, you have a business, and you move into a new office. In order for your office to be thoroughly furnished, it requires to have certain things. Um, you may need a computer. You may need a fax machine. You obviously will need a desk and a chair. If you don't have AC, I advise you to go buy a fan. <laughs> if you don't have heat, buy some form of portable heater. But there are certain things that is required in order for something to be thoroughly furnished. You do not walk the road naked because society tells you you are crazy if you do so. So therefore, to be thoroughly furnished, to walk the street, you make sure and cover your blessed body. Then you are thoroughly furnished. You don't walk the road. You don't go into your job barefoot. You are not thoroughly furnished. But the word of God that is given to us by the king of this kingdom that we are part of has given us his laws, his rules, his instructions so that we can be fully equipped. And not just equipped, but fully dressed. And have all that we need to live in the kingdom. We are not the one making the rules. Woo! Trying not to do that yet. Another thing we need to understand in the kingdom. Give me First Peter chapter five, verse six and eight to eight. First Peter. No. It, this is one kingdom that require humility. It says, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. Casting all your care upon him for we care it for you. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The thing about the kingdom of God, 
It is not stagnant. Or let me say, the people in the kingdom should not be stagnant. God desires to promote each and every one of us. God desires to take us from stage one to stage whatever he desires. I don't know. But the thing about it is, in order for us to advance in this kingdom, the Bible says we must first humble ourselves. I've heard people pray, and I want to advise you as, a, as one of your pastors. Do not ever pray and ask God to humble you. It's not a prayer that's according to scripture. Don't do it. Oh, Pastor Sam, you're preaching heresy. Somebody shake their head. Yes, I'm preaching heresy. <laughs> Don't ever pray and ask God to humble you. You would not like what you have to go through. Do you know what is required to humble a person? <laughs> you all remember Nebuchadnezzar? You all can remember King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel chapter 4, verse 24. Give me that, please. Let me show you what happens when God has to humble a man. This is, the, the king had a dream and wanted the interpretation of his dream, and he went to Daniel. And Daniel responded to the king. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the degree of the Most High, the God of the kingdom, which is come upon my Lord the king. That they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as an ox. And they shall wet thee with dew of heaven, and seven times, which is seven years, shall pass over thee, till thou know, till thou know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men, and give it to he giveth it to whomsoever he will. What was happening here is that Nebuchadnezzar became proud and said to himself, look what I have accomplished with my own hands. Not understanding that God was the one that gave to him what he had gotten. And God turned and said, oh, so you don't recognize and acknowledge the fact that I'm the one that gave you what you have. So you say to yourself that you are big and you are mighty. You have accomplished this. God said, I know just what to do to you. Let's read on. He said, and whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, the kingdom shall be sure unto thee. Af after, look at this. I'm going to make you become like a beast. But I will leave a stump in the root. And I would not totally destroy you, Nebuchadnezzar. There is hope for you. But the hope will be manifested after you know that, what, that thou shalt know that the, that, that the heavens do rule. What, 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 what is he talking about when he said the heavens? He's talking about the God that rule in the heavens. God said, I'm going to make you what you're supposed to be and give you back your throne, but after you acknowledge the fact that I'm in charge of the kingdom. Let's read on. He said, wherefore, O king, let my counsel. Now, bear in mind, Daniel is talking to the king and telling the king he will become like a beast. Daniel must have been shaking because the king could have his neck cut off. That's why he had to address the king respectfully. And he said, wherefore, O king, he's actually kind of pleading with the king now. Let my counsel be accepted unto thee. I am asking you, don't get mad, don't get angry. He said, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and, in thy, and thy iniquity by showing mercy to the poor, if it be by lengthening of thy tranquility. Let's go fast, quickly. He said, and this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar, 29. And the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And he, this is what the king said. It's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by, my, by the might of who? My power. And for thy honor. And, and for the honor of my, my, my majesty. Go on. First. 
He said, while the word was yet in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from you. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as an ox, and seven years shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he. There is a king in the kingdom that does what he wants, because it is his kingdom. And he may give you authority to do something, but that don't mean you are master of yourself. He refused to humble himself and to give the glory to God. And God made, God humbled him. Do you want that? <laughs> Hence the reason why the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That he may exalt you. Because if he has to humble you, whoo, God have mercy. No amount of praying and fasting, speaking in tongues, no amount of offering could change what God will do. If he have to humble a man, I beg you, of, uh, do not pray and ask God to humble you. <laughs> Cut that out your prayer. Do your best, find a way to humble yourself because if he have to turn and humble you, you don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible said the man's fingernails grow like, a, the, the, like an eagle's claw. His hair grow like the beast. The Jew fell on him. The man ate grass like a cow. Grass in the morning, grass in the... Grass, grass, grass. Do you want that for your food? This is what happens when God humbles a man. The Bible admonishes us in the kingdom of God to get anywhere. You must first humble yourself. Bring yourself in a low esteem and understand that you're not in charge. He is the one that rules. And if he rules in the affairs of men, how much more his own kingdom? <laughs> it's not yours. It's not mine. It belongs to him. John 15, 15 and 16. Kingdom don't belong to us. Look at this. He said, henceforth I call you not servant, but the, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father I have made known unto you. He and he have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. We think we save just because we repent. No, it was a choosing by Almighty God. In this kingdom, you can't just come and say, I'm a part of the kingdom. No, no, no. No man come unless the, the spirit draws him. So when you think you save because we repent, baby, let me tell you this. <laughs> To burst your bubble. Yes, you had to repent. But you only say because you are chosen. Not so much just because you repent. No. He said, you have not chosen me. Look, look at it. He was, he was elevating them. He said, listen, I'm, I, you are no longer servants. You are my friends. I bring you close to my side. I'm going to tell you everything. Every little secret I have, I'll make it known to you. So I'm promoting you from servant, just following me, watching me do. And, and, and now I'm going to make you do. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you something that you didn't have before. I'm calling you friend. But I want you to know something. Don't be prideful because I'm making you a friend. Because you didn't really choose me. I'm the one that... So, so while he, he elevated them, he gave them something to help them to remain humble. So they don't get puffed up. And sometimes we can become like that. We may get a little promotion in the church and we think, well, now I'm it. Everybody got to serve me now. But the kingdom is not yours. Everything that you say or do should be to bring glory to the one who the kingdom belongs to. Yeah. 
God, God help us if we make some people pastors. <laughs> Jesus. They may only be counsel that God is telling me that you might be one that to be ordained as a pastor. No oil laid on the head. No prayer yet. It's just something the Lord is saying. And the time is not yet, but you start functioning like you're there. You want to tell people where they must go, how they must do, and, and, and you, must, you must wait on me. I'm a pastor now, but <laughs> God Almighty, if you all understand, let me say this, please. I beg you. I beg you. It's a good thing to be called of God and chosen of God, but it requires much sacrifice to please him. And people believe that being a pastor is the ultimate goal. It's not. Let me tell you something. God don't honor pastoral ship. The Bible says he honors faithfulness. Whatsoever you are called in to do in the kingdom that don't belong to you. The Bible says God honors faithfulness. A faithful steward. One that has proven themselves faithful is the one that God honors. God don't want a pride. God don't want a position. Everybody want this pulpit thing. I am telling you, I come here many times. It's not easy. Don't envy anybody that comes on this pulpit. I am telling you. This is a sacred place where the presence of God is. And I'm telling you, the anointing is here. And it is a dangerous thing as much as it is good. <laughs> in other words, please be faithful in your call. Don't envy nobody. Don't jealous nobody. Don't look at this. And want to be here. You might do a lot more than we do up here where you are. Be faithful. This is what God honors. God don't honor position. God is not interested in title, even though he gave it to man. And when I say he's not interested, not that he's not concerned, he gave it, he's concerned. But because a, a title, that don't mean you get into heaven be, and, and you're going to be ruler over people. No, that don't mean you're going to get the biggest reward. No. It's your faithfulness to the thing that he called you to do. It is his kingdom. Oh, Lord. Let's move on because, oh, Lord Almighty, Lord Almighty. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. It say, 19, yes. What know he not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Which he have of God. Number one, the Holy Ghost is not yours. It's of God. And, he are not, and you are not even your own. Go ahead. For he was bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Which are God's. Which belongs to him. We belong to the king. He brought us into his kingdom. But we are not our own. We must understand this in the kingdom of God. We are not our own. We are not masters of our own destiny. All those seminars they have and telling you, you are the master of your destiny, that's a lie. Your destiny is determined by God. And it requires obedience and humility for that which God has for you to come to pass in your life. Yes, you do have a part to play, but the ultimate, the, uh, the, the ultimate outcome is what God desires. The goal is what God desires. Your part is being faithful and obedient. That's it. It is his kingdom. Now let's get to the juice of this. That was just the foundation being laid. I need just 10 more minutes. And I'll be fine. Mark chapter 16. Your responsibility in this kingdom. Now that we understand the kingdom, the, the, the kingdom belongs to God and we are in the kingdom and we have certain authority and privilege, but they don't belong to us. So therefore we cannot do what we want. We must do what he says. Now look at your responsibility in the kingdom of God. Mark 16, 15 and 20. 15. And he said unto them, 
Go he into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of, of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Look at this. Our responsibility in the kingdom. He command them to go. Now, something that baffled my mind with the scripture that we just read is that God was not asking them to work with him. The Bible says, they obeyed, went forth and preached. And God said, huh? They obey me. Well, then I can't sit on my throne. I got to get busy too. And the Bible says, God was working with them. All the while Jesus was walking the earth, they was working with Jesus. Suddenly, a big change came. And the Lord took his position in heaven on his throne. And he said, there's going to be a difference now. You were working with me all the time. Where I went, you just went. But now it's going to be different. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to back up what you say. I'm going to back up what you do. So if you say nothing, I back up nothing. If you do nothing, I back up nothing. If you do little, I back up little. If you do much, I back up much. If you stand for me to the point that it might be risking your life, I'm going to stand and risk mine too. So this is exactly what the Lord did for them. Because they obeyed him. The Bible said, and they went forth. This is, our, this is our responsibility in the kingdom of God. Our responsibility in the kingdom of God is that to come up here on a Sunday morning, a Wednesday night, or whenever, and just receive word. Our responsibility in the kingdom that don't belong to us, that belongs to him, his commission and his, 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 his command to us is to go into all the world and preach. I said to the church, I was fortunate to preach to the church back in Trinidad when I went on vacation. And it is very sad to see certain things that are happening in my small little country that I was born in. It seem, seemingly, gangs are trying to take over the nation. Seemingly. And as a result of that, the churches has, has become sort of secular. Because if they leave where they live to go in another community to preach, they might be gone down. Watch this. These men and women were following Jesus wherever Jesus went. Jesus was about to be taken to heaven. As a matter of fact, he was taken to heaven. The Bible says he was received. And these men went forth in obedience in the midst of all the chaos that was happening around them. And they preached. And the Bible said because they forget the fact that their life might be taken from them, God stood up and worked with them. I said to the church in Trinidad, you all are missing one of the greatest opportunities for one of the, some of the greatest miracles that the church here could ever experience. Because you all are afraid of going out because your life might be taken from you. But don't you think that this God who commands you to go regardless is able to stand with you when you go? Can you imagine you go in a community where they may kill you, but you stand and preach and everybody sat down like humble dogs? Do you not know God is able to do that? They have, I told them you all are missing out on some of the greatest opportunity for some of the greatest miracle you all can ever experience in this country. The Bible said not they was working with God, but God was working with them. God got off his throne in heaven. And as they went forth, he went with them. 
confirming the word by signs following. They experienced some of the greatest signs, wonders, and miracles because they went. Not because they come to church. I'm going to preach now. We are content with coming to church. And the world is dying and going to hell. Well, I, Pastor Sam, you can see what you want. You don't be there. I don't know how to talk to people. Don't you know how to gossip? Don't you know how to be on the phone for over an hour talking about somebody else? Well, then you can preach. You think preaching is just from the pulpit? They had no pulpit back in those days. Philip got an instruction. There's a chariot going west. Go in the desert place by the crossroad. Meet the, meet the chariot. He ain't had no pulpit. He ain't had no mic and no oil lay on his head, no ordination. No. They ain't had no special service for Philip. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you may go forth and bring fruit and that your fruit may remain. This is the command of the Lord. This is his commission to us. This is the instruction of the king in his kingdom. But all we want to do is come to church for the love of almighty God. You don't come to church. You are the church. And the church has a responsibility to go and preach the gospel to every creature. Don't be afraid. The Lord said, open your mouth and I will fill it with words. He said, don't be afraid when they bring you before kings and the courts to, to judge you for my sake. He said, when that time comes, I will put words in your mouth. Listen, we can be as scared as a, as a mouse. But let me tell you something. When we open our mouth, the Lord is with us. And we must understand. Don't, be, uh, don't worry about all. Don't be so afraid. God will equip you. As a matter of fact, he has already equipped you. He said your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who lives in you. So that's the equipping. You have him with you. Don't you want to see signs, wonders, and miracles wrought through your hands? Don't only bring them in church so pastor can pray for them. No. He said, them that believe in my name, this is what they will do. You have the power in you. Why will God Almighty, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, give you something to do that he know you cannot do? That what kind of God will he be? No, but he equipped you. He said, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Who lives in you and you are not your own. The thing about it is we believe we belong to ourselves. So that's why we don't let loose and just let him have his way. If we release it to him. Then we will see how easy it is to tell somebody about the Lord. Listen, God will show up. I'm telling you the truth. He will show up on your behalf. I remember I told you all, I marched into my director office and held her hands and prayed for her when she got the position. You think I wasn't a little shaky and wondering what she was going to say? But I heard the Lord telling me, go pray for that woman. And I, went, I took another Christian with me, an older gentleman, and he was most, I thought I had support. Hey, the man was scared. Been working there longer than I have. But I heard the Lord go and pray for her. Go pray for her. So I, I call him. I say, listen, I want to go pray for this lady. And we, we went, went into the office and we held, listen, held her hands and prayed. God, give her the wisdom to leave this place. She will have tough decisions to make. God move on her behalf. Now let me ask you this. Do you think if Sam is in any kind of trouble on the job, she's the director now. She overrides. You don't think because of my praying for her, I, I, the Lord will give me a little favor? 
You see, I must get a little favor because she remembered that I prayed for her. Uh -huh. And I think it's time to go pray for her again. <laughs> I don't know. You see, you see, we as Christians, we are so spiritual. And we don't understand simple things. Yeah? They're giving you trouble, that's all right. Just can I pray for them? You don't understand. Listen, let me leave that part up. But we can, life can be so much easier if we do some simple things. This is all I want to say. Some simple things. Let's move on. I, I, I got two more things I need to just bring out quickly. So our responsibility in the kingdom is to go preach. And once we get up off our royal blessings, the Lord will, be, will work with us. Second thing, Matthew chapter 5 verse 12 to 16. We must understand that we have a light within us. Uh, he said, you are, you are the light of the world. Give me Matthew, please. Give me, give me Matthew. Matthew 5 verse 12. He said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Great, exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which went before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. I'm sorry for this high blood pressure thing. I'm really sorry. Because I'm telling you the truth. I can't understand why salt is killing people when God used salt. <laughs> Honestly, I really don't. All you nurses and doctors, help me to understand this high blood pressure di disease. Because they say salt is what, when you have high blood pressure, salt make it worse, right, pa Pastor Uchi? Why in the world salt is killing people? When God likened me and you as salt. And our duty is not to kill people. <laughs> I, I don't understand. There must be something that went wrong somewhere with mankind, Pastor Uchi. You're a nurse. You registered everything. There must be something wrong with mankind. Why salt is killing them. It's not the salt. Believe me, it cannot be the salt. Because back in the days, they didn't have refrigerator. And means of making ice. So they used to salt their meat to make it last long. So how in the world today? Salt is killing. I, something is wrong with man. Pastor Ochi, do more research. You're, maybe you might, you might become a multimillionaire if you find out. But it cannot be. Something wrong. Because the Bible tells me the church is the salt of the earth. Yeah? He said, but if the salt lose his savior, if your flavor has gone out, he said, you are good for nothing. But to be thrown on, let men walk on top of you. Do you wonder why some men are, God Almighty, do you wonder why some men might be treating you the way they are? Where is your flavor? Are you adding anything to the people that you come in contact with? Like I said, you don't know how to preach, but you know how to gossip. If people hear you gossiping about them, do you think they want the God that you are serving? How could you tell them about God when you're telling them how you're telling other people, boy, she ugly. He ain't cute at all. Oh, please. Ah, who tell them that baby cute? How do you say these things about people? And people are hearing you and then you want them to lovey-dovey with you. No, you are the salt. The salt flavors. The salt preserves. Do you know one other thing that salt does? It cures. If you are in anywhere where you get cut and you cannot go, Pastor Uchi is a nurse. If you don't know this, he better go and run with it quick. He might make some money. If you are somewhere and you get cut and you don't have any form of medication, if you take salt and put it in that wound or that cut, it's going to burn you till you want tears drop off your nose. But I'm telling you, that salt will preserve that wound from forming worms. And it will, it will help heal the cut or the wound, whatever it is. Uh -huh. It's painful now. I'm telling you, it's very painful. But it heals. Oh, Lord. And sometimes, to do some things for the kingdom of God as the salt is very painful. But I guarantee you, it preserves it heals. It cures. Listen, 
we got to get to the point where we understand we are not our own. I'm telling you, it's very important. Because as the salt, some things you have to do as salt. It's not an easy task, you know. It's not easy. Because they take that old dead meat. And then take the salt and rub the salt in it. For the salt to preserve that old meat. That dead meat. It's not easy. People use you anyhow they want to. To do anything they want. That's what they do with salt. Oh, they put a little bit. It's not enough. Put a little more. Sometimes they put too much. They take, especially with rice. They will take the rice and wash out the salt. You put me in there now you're washing me out. Why are you using me like that? Because that's what salt is for. You need to understand that is the purpose of salt. Eventually, they will come to understand how to use you. But you got to remain being flavorful. If you lose that, then you lose your purpose in the kingdom. You are the salt. You are the salt. Let's read on. You're good for nothing and deserve to be thrown under. Let's look at one more thing. One more thing. Giving in the kingdom. Well, this is a thing people don't like to talk about. And people believe that giving is just money. But let's talk about money just for a minute. Because there's a lot of people that say that tithes and offering is not New Testament doctrine. I'm not here to argue that with you. I'm not here to say who right, who wrong. But let's say, Paraventia, you're right. That giving is an Old Testament thing. Let's say paraventure, just in case you're right. Just in case. Could you tell me what is New Testament giving? <laughs> All of you that sitting here and watching by way of media that find that tithes and offering is too hard to give because it's Old Testament, you will start to give tithes and offering after I read a scripture for you. Give me, um, give me Acts chapter 4. I didn't give you this one. Acts chapter 4 verse 33 to 35. Look at this. We don't like to give 10% because that's too much. And as a matter of fact, now, this is not, I am not saying I believe this. Huh? I'm saying what people say. As a matter of fact, you can show me nowhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, where they give tithes and offering. As a matter, that was Old Testament giving. Power of venture, you're right power of rent here, just in case. I will show you New Testament giving. And with great joy give the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them. New Testament giving. You own a house? All who own house, raise your hands. Including myself. Raise all your hand with boldness. Go sell it. <laughs> and bring the money. And later the apostle feet. That New Testament given. The Bible said, anybody own land? Whether here or overseas. God knows. Raise your hand. Go sell it. You don't believe in 10% given? Then give all. Because that is exactly what they did. If you don't believe 10% is New Testament, well, this is New Testament. The Bible says all of them that had all these things, they sold it and brought the money, not in the bank. <laughs> they didn't take the money and invest it in stocks. They brought it and laid at the apostles' feet. They sold them. And the Bible said they took the money and distributed to every member of the church that had need. And at that point in time, no man lack. New Testament given for you. All of you that have house and land, you don't believe in 10%. The book of Acts, New Testament. Early church. Not even midway down church time. Early church. Let me say this to us. Everything that we have belongs to God. 
I'm not telling you this just because I want to tell you the scripture is there. Only time that I cannot continue any longer because of time. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells you, you were bought with a price. You are not your own. If I am not my own, how could what I have belong to me? Uh, if I don't belong to myself, and I dip in my pocket and I pull out something, well, I'm not my own. So therefore then, if what I have, how could it be mine? You, do you all understand that? Because... I am more important than what I have. And if I don't belong to me, then in no way what I possess could be mine. It must be belonging to the one to whom I belong to. And if we come to that understanding, and I could flip the script here, because it's not just about money. It's about the gifts and talents he put inside of you. That you sitting down on. And then doing nothing with it. He give it to you not for your own sake. It don't belong to you. It was given to the benefit of the church. And some of us are not doing anything with it. Do you not know you will give an account to God for the things you have done. And the things you did not do that he has told us to do. We are going to give an account. We have a king that we have to, to, to report to. One day he's going to come and he's going to require an, uh, for all of us an account. What will we say then? We are not our own. The kingdom don't belongs to us. The kingdom belongs to God. We are in the kingdom. We are a part of the kingdom. We have authority and position in the kingdom. But we belongs to the one that is the king of the kingdom. So therefore our responsibility in this kingdom is to obey the one that is the king. Listen, in the, in, in, in the Bible times, in these, when I say Bible times, when men walk the earth that, 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 that are recorded in, the, in this Bible. In those days, they disobey the king. You know what was the requirement? Esther, who was the king's wife? Who comfort him at night, in the afternoon, in the morning, sun up, sun down, whenever he want. Couldn't do what she wanted to do in the kingdom. Because she understood, though she was queen, the kingdom was not hers. She had a responsibility and a duty in the kingdom that was not hers. So she had to go in line with the law and the rule of the kingdom. We are not bigger than the one that have called us. Could we stand to our feet? Could we stand to our feet? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. The kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent take it by force. God, you have called us into your kingdom. Even as Esther for such a time as this. Where we must take the message of the kingdom to them that are lost. Where we must let our light shine before men that they may see our good works. And not glorify us, but to glorify you who is in heaven. Who are the king in the kingdom. Help us, Father. That we may please you and do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on and clap. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit us at Fountain of Grace, 427 Turnpike Street, Canton, Massachusetts, 02021. Or give us a call at 781-821-1121. Or feel free to give us an email at admin at fountainofgracebos.org. Or visit us at our website at www.fogbos.org.